I'm so excited to be joined by Rachel Bird, and thank you so much for my pleasure. joining me. I wanted to start by saying how much I love you as a broadcaster, first of all, and to have done it for so long and to be such a recognisable voice and just to meet you in person is lovely. Um, thank you so much. That's so <laughs> nice to hear. When you say um, someone who's been doing it for so long, it does feel now like quite a long time and probably like I should have gone and done something else by now, but I'm still there. No plugging away, gripping onto that microphone. And with getting into the job, which I find is sometimes hard to cast our minds back when, when it's just day-to-day life and you're in it now. But how? what was the first step kind of getting into that industry? Because I know that you had people in the family who were very creative. And I'm always so jealous of people who had maybe people mentioning fun things at home because... I just, I feel like no one really wanted to work in that industry in my family. Yeah, I mean, I was really lucky. My dad was a journalist for many, many years. Now, he actually left the BBC before I joined and we didn't quite manage to pass the baton between us, but almost. And there's no doubt he was an influence because I grew up in a world where I listened to radio news all the time from a very young age. And then he worked on television. So I used to get up and watch him on breakfast television as well in the morning. So that was a major influence in my life. So that was kind of there in the background. But in all honesty, I didn't have a fixed idea of what I wanted to do when I went to university. And even as I was coming to the end of my degree course, um, I just got that kind of panic of, oh, crikey, what am I going to do next? And I applied to one journalism postgraduate course because I very much wanted, if I was going to work in journalism, to work in radio. And this was a broadcast course. And I was just really fortunate to get on it. I don't quite know how I managed it because everyone else who turned up at the interview had their portfolios and were wearing a suit and had loads of experience. And I just turned up in an old pair of trainers and literally nothing on me to show. Um, But I did have a kind of great passion for radio. I used to consume it all the time. And I can only think that that in some way was enough to persuade them to take a chance on me. So that's really where it started. And from there, I very much wanted to stay in local radio. And I got my first job on a tiny local radio station, BBC Radio Suffolk. And I had 15 fantastic months there. And the great thing about being somewhere small is that you're asked to do absolutely everything. So Mm. you grow in the world really, really quickly. You learn to kind of acquire all these extra skills um, and fit into different roles very fast. And so it was a brilliant, brilliant um, learning curve for me, that first one. And then from there, I've stayed in the BBC. I'm completely institutionalised. But from there, I went to a bigger city station so I went to Bristol and it was there that I then eventually started presenting and from there moved to Five Live and I've been at Five Live ever since. That's amazing I know I totally agree with kind of starting out being a bit of a generalist and then you kind of find Mm. the thing you actually like it's very rare to just know isn't it like immediately. exactly and I always loved being on air but I did I did kind of veer into management for a while Um, but I had this itch about presenting and I just kept bugging my boss at Radio Bristol at the time to let me have a go. And at that stage in my life, um, I was still going out and partying a lot and my voice was terrible. So my voice is a bit scratchy anyway. But if it's in any way, um, um, if it's in any way kind of overused or stretched or abused, (laughs) i.e. just talking in a loud pub or club, it completely goes. So my boss kept saying to me, you've got to sort out your voice first. (laughs) So I did have to do a sort of bit of a lifestyle change so that my voice was a bit more reliable. and, um, and Quite then, like a bit of the husk, you know, when you've got a little bit of a cold well, and it sounds a bit yeah, scratchy. To be honest, it is what it is. It's one of those things I can't change it entirely, you know. But I do. I did have to have a working instrument day to day, if you like. So yes. there was a little bit of kind of conscientious or conscious care that went into, into that. But um, once you kind of gave me a go being on air, I just kind of took the opportunity with both hands I really grasped it and made the best of it that I could and and thankfully you know she she liked it and then sort of helped progress me from there yeah it's funny thinking about the voice as an instrument of course it is in that job it's It's like it's basically your thing that you need to really take care of Mm. Um, but back to that uh, first interview that you just mentioned where you kind of turned up um, feeling a little bit maybe outside what other people were prepared for but I know it sounds really cliche but do you think there is something about being yourself in those situations Definitely. And there's one very specific moment within this. um, It was a day long kind of series of tests and interviews. I did really badly in all the current affairs tests. I think I scored about like 10 out of 25 in the current affairs test. It was terrible. And I almost left the day long 
interview process halfway through because I thought this has just gone to complete pot. Um, but um, but I had nowhere to go. So I decided then I'd just kind of hang out for the second half of the day. And in one of the group interview moments, they set a dilemma for us all, all about disclosures in journalism. Effectively, if you were given a sensitive piece of information, would you share it? And almost everyone around the table said yes. And I think I was one of the few, if not the only person to say no, because it related to a very specific security situation. And the reason I said no is because it's not, you know, it's not all about you and the story. Sometimes, you know, there is a greater good that you sort of have to acknowledge. But I think all the kind of young guns were like, yeah, we'd print it. It would be out there. Of course we would. Um, And I'm not saying it was particularly the right answer, my attitude at all. But I think by then I had a bit of a, ah, sure, you know, sod it attitude. And I'll just kind of say what I feel is instinctively the right thing to say. And I think I have a feeling that, because I just remember a bit, a, a, some, an eye contact I made with the tutor at the time. And I just had a feeling that they quite liked that I was able to sort of stick to my guns and yeah. and justify my position and wasn't afraid to say something that was slightly against the grain of where everyone else was going. Because that's quite a difficult thing to do, I feel, even in like adult life where you feel established in your career to, if the whole room is saying one thing, to say, oh, I don't actually agree, if it's a ratio thing. Yeah, I think I've hard. always been a bit of a contrarian, to be honest. Yeah. I grew but up in a household of four brothers, so I think I've always been quite able to enjoy disagreements. And <laughs> it's yeah. probably just arguing with people for the sake of it, probably. <laughs> but also these things will tie in to the job, don't they, in a, in, a, in a strange way, because I always find it funny when teachers say something like, oh, you won't stop talking or you have too many opinions. And it's like, well, I'm going to go and be a journalist. <laughs> yeah, it's like you see it in your own children. You see certain elements of their personalities. And, you know, one of mine is incredibly stubborn. And part of me thinks that's an amazing facility to have and a resource to use when you're older but it's a pain in the bum in my household <laughs> so could you just tone it down a bit tone it down for now and then you'll mm, fly exactly um so i wanted to ask you about presenting it's such a skill to to hone and you've been doing it for 9 years on the on the break yeah the show that you i've been do. presenting since i think about 90 no 2000 since about 2000 i think so i've probably been presenting nearly 20 years since 2003 at Five Live and on The Breakfast Show for nine years. Nine years, amazing. And how do you find staying true to yourself when you're perhaps reading a script or you're reading a prompter or you're essentially, well, you're not acting, but you are performing essentially for your listeners. How do you kind of inject yourself into that? Well, so much of what we do at Five Live is unscripted, really. Um, There's the straightforward news bit, which is, of course, scripted and written for you. And you have to be straight down the line with that. But the rest of it, although it's a news programme, it's also um, very much kind of led by the relationship between the presenters and the audience. So all the way through, I think you have to be your authentic self because I think the listeners will sniff out straight away if you're not. And it is very different to perhaps more conventional radio news programmes because you do give more of yourself, you do reveal more of yourself. So that makes it a lovely thing to do. It also makes it quite an exposing thing to do because you're aware that some people really like you, some people you may deeply irritate. But I think the only way to kind of deal with that is to try and be honest to yourself and one danger I think is that you get into second guessing what other people want to hear and I think that's what gets you into trouble because um, the the, the times I've regretted either the things I've said or an approach I've taken towards an interview um, are the times when I haven't listened to my instinct on it and I try to work out okay what's the best approach here what does a presenter do in this situation or what do I think the listeners want to hear whereas I think actually After all the experience I've had, I think I probably do have an inner voice that I can generally trust Mm. and um, and listen to that instead, which sounds terribly pretentious. So I'm sorry. No, but I also think that's super important, especially in a time where we're living in with so much noise, Mm. especially online. People are telling us like left, right and centre what to think. So channeling that feeling that you had in that group when you sort of sat back and said, what do I actually think? It's really, really good to have. Yeah. And also, I think a little bit of self-doubt is fine that, you know, you can not know stuff. And I think um, as a radio presenter, particularly in news, you kind of feel like you have to be someone with encyclopedic knowledge about everything. But actually, I think 
curious minds, and I think this applies to any workplace, actually, having a curious mind is really important. Putting up your hand and saying, I don't know how to do this or um, I don't know about this particular subject area. Mm. This is a bit of a weakness of mine. Can you help me out here? And, you know, even recently during all the political stuff, I've gone back to people I trust, experts, to source, you know, reliable information, give me guidance because... You know, you're always learning and you can't be expected to. And as you say, when you've got to try and filter through all the noise that's around, you can't be expected to have, you know, absolutely everything here to the front of your mind all the time. So I think it's all right to say sometimes, yeah, I'm just not sure. Totally. And also that freedom to change your mind. Mm. Like I I, I think I change my mind most days on things. (laughs) Just a 360. Don't agree with that now. Well, you see, that's quite unusual these days, isn't it? Because people are so set in their views. <laughs> yeah, like chiselling it in stone. Like, this is my personality. Mm. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, when you became a mother and how that impacts a career. Because, I mean, I'm coming at this from having no idea. <laughs> um, and I thought it would be quite a, a relatable question for people listening as well. Because I know sometimes it's kind of not... Uh, easy obviously but like you can just it just sort of happens you make it work but I think it can also be an obstacle or a challenge because it's just a huge life change I wondered if you could talk a little bit about it yeah I think it's really really difficult and I think um, it's still a conversation that women are having more than men Um, although I think increasingly dads are taking um, more of a view about you know how it impacts on their lives and their careers and taking time out which I think is only a good thing and I think the more the conversation drives towards that, the better. Mm-hmm. So that's the first thing I'd say. But inevitably, the bulk of um, you know childcare and responsibility, particularly in those early years, does fall towards the mother. It is women whose careers are impacted by that. It's difficult from my point of view. I've been incredibly lucky because I've had a career that I can work, you know, pretty much part time. So when I had my first um, three children, I was only working two, three, four shifts a week, and I could be fairly flexible about that. Um, so I was able to return to work quite quickly and phase my way back in, and and that, that was brilliant, and I'm aware that that's not as straightforward for everyone else. Mm-hmm. So I, and I felt very well supported by work, so it, it didn't have too much of an impact. The, the crisis point really came when I um, perhaps slightly foolishly, very arrogantly decided I could accommodate a fourth child in my life and kind of went into it having had three very straightforward pregnancies thinking oh it'll be a doddle and um and I think I was naive and um foolish because then the fourth came along and I developed severe uh, preeclampsia and he had to be born nine weeks early and he was born at three pounds and um that was all slightly traumatic and I had to be um uh, taken to a hospital miles and miles and miles from the family and basically spent eight weeks in hospital with the child and he's all fine so sort of hugely grateful for that now but that was ch- definitely a moment where I thought you know the, the the finely balanced deck of cards is going to collapse now mm-hmm. I kept everything going up until this point and now is when I get my comeuppance um, and so I, in that situation well I suppose the number one priority initially is just the health of your baby and your own health and once you get that onto an even keel and things are kind of you know ticking along and getting back to where they should approximately be and um, then your mind sort of starts focusing on right how the hell am I going to manage this with work and I'm going to have to take a bit more time off and and I think first of all having a supportive boss is really helpful and the BBC were brilliant and my own boss in particular um, who made it very clear to me from the start that um, it, you know I, I absolutely could choose my own way back into work and he'd support me on that um, and I had to fund a little bit of that myself and just phase my way back in, but it was worth doing that. And then um, and then it's just about kind of crafting the team around you, isn't it, to help, be it, you know, your immediate family, the older kids coming in to help and your husband and the role he plays, your wider family, parents-in-law, your friends, your army of female friends who I 100% could not manage without, who are always on hand to pick a child up or... Mm. Um, you know, drop a child off somewhere. And um, and then just the support of people at work around you as well when you come back in. So um, although it was a bit of a crisis point, actually, I was incredibly fortunate that, you know, all of those sort of teams mm-hmm. around me made it much, much easier. And, and it did feel like a moment in my career where I should have, could have been concentrating on, you know, going off and exploring other avenues. And I, and I definitely kind of, 
um, slightly put the kibosh on all of that. But then that's fine. That's the decision I made and I have no complaints about mm. that. That's amazing. And just a reminder that no thing really can be done totally alone. Like we need our support system. We need other people at work and outside of work. Oh my God, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I know where that phrase, it takes a village now, comes from. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> but um, I wondered with something like that that happens, because I, I don't think we ever forget those moments that happen, do we? Like you can't just immediately kind of move on. Um, what? How did that impact you kind of moving forward? I, I don't know whether, you know, when some people are like love planning and then they realise, oh, I actually can't plan now to to a T, but actually it's sort of a positive. Is is there anything you learned during that that's actually changed you now? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, my life, my house was never perfect anyway, <laughs> but I think just letting the cracks show a lot more was going to be an inevitability and just um, dropping the ball over and over. It's a brilliant book by a woman called Tiffany Dufu so good. called Drop the Ball. Have you read yes. it? Um, and I read that like twice over immediately. I finished it and then read it again. And uh, and it's just about letting stuff go and saying, I said, you know what, I can't achieve this, that to-do list. You know, I'm going to get to one and two and that's mm-hmm. it. And it doesn't matter if I don't make a homemade cake for the bloody kids, you know, a craft fair or whatever. Just manage as best you can, delegate where you can and make do because at the end of the day, the fundamentally important things are um, having time with the people that are, you know, most important to you, whoever that might be. And and then, you know, giving yourself the opportunity to do the best you can in your field of work or whatever it is that you do to fulfil yourself. So, Everything else is just a bit ir- irrelevant. And yeah, yeah, okay, you need to get the washing done and you need to kind of occasionally run a duster over the furniture. But actually, you know, phew, you're not going to be wondering about that, you know, if you make it to your 70s, are you? <laughs> totally. I feel actually more relaxed now just hearing you say that. Because <laughs> I, I really agree with, um, you know, picking picking your strengths, picking the things you're good at and doing it. But also it's okay to be average at some things. Oh, yeah. Just let, let them go. Yeah. Just get them done. Definitely. When you're so passionate about your role and your love for radio, your love for broadcasting, does it help with those moments where you're not having a bad day or you're having some setbacks? Does it just, it kind of helps to love what you do, I'm guessing? Definitely. I mean, the one question I always get asked, and I think I've pretty much through my career worked early in the morning through most of it, um, and particularly now, so I'm, I'm up at 3.30 in the morning, five days a week. So the thing that people always ask is, oh my God, how do you deal with those hours? What time do you go to bed? How much sleep do you get? And um, and it is, it's brutal. It's pretty punishing. But, you know, let's not pretend that I'm standing on a hospital ward for 14 hours in a row. You know, I, I'm, I, do, I do a job I love and, and, and the hours are, are pretty short. And, it, you know, that time goes really quickly in the studio. You know what that's like. Um, so it, it is a job I feel hugely privileged to do. Um, but also, if ever, when that alarm goes off, nothing ever, no matter how many years you do of it, gets you used to the sound of the alarm at half three in the morning <laughs> and you feel like death. But when it goes off, I genuinely say to myself, is there anything else in the world I want to do right now in terms of paying the mortgage off? And there isn't. And I know and I do consciously remind myself that I'm phenomenally lucky to be able to get up and face each new day. And the other brilliant thing with a radio show is that every day is different. Mind you, having said that recently, people will think that, oh God, all you do is talk about the same thing over and over and over and over again. And there is an element of that at the moment. <laughs> uh, but you still don't know what's going to happen. The news breaks all the time. There are different themes, different stories that emerge. And so it's always evolving. So every day is fresh. And I think that's what kind of keeps you interested and engaged. And then the other thing, and again, it sounds a bit naff to say it, but I actually genuinely believe it is I'm I'm always trying to improve. Um, I'm never quite satisfied. You come away from every programme and think, oh, I wish I'd said this or done it that way or that would have sounded better. And almost every single day I'm kind of slightly castigating myself. And then, and then you go away and you forget about it and you come in the next day. But that, I think, keeps you sort of engaged and... Um, with a degree of enthusiasm for it every day. And then the other thing I've done is I've um, I've also, in, in recent years, realised I need to look for other opportunities that complement what I do. So I've been doing some work for BBC Breakfast, which is based in the studio just upstairs from where we are. So that's been 
a really lovely thing to do because it's a completely different form of broadcasting. You know, you've got to get your hair right and you've got to sit properly and, you know, all of those challenges, which <laughs> sounds like it should be quite easy, but it's really uncomfortable sitting still properly for three <laughs> hours on a really uncomfortable sofa. Poor me. <laughs> they um, don't want to make it too comfortable, the sofa, no, otherwise. Right, you fall asleep. <laughs> um, no, but it is, it's just a different kind of challenge and I really love that. It's a different kind of live broadcast environment. And um, so, yeah, so sort of exploring other little avenues just to keep um, yourself fresh I think is quite important when you've been in that role for so long but I don't want to leave the role I'm in because I love it so I think it's then just finding sort of additional ways of stretching yourself within that. Yes definitely because when you talk to people who have been in a in a similar role or the same role for that amount of time there has to be something keeping them there because otherwise I think as humans we do want a little bit of a challenge every single day and um, it's amazing that you found that within within a role yeah, I think so. I think so. And, you know, occasionally you'll have that meeting with the boss and that hideous question of, you know, where do you see yourself in five years time? And I haven't a clue. And part of me wants to say, well, just here, rocking along, doing the same old thing, if that's OK with you, when you know they're thinking, no, it's time for you to move on and do something else. So I I don't know. I, I've always been a little of the view that if I'm enjoying it and finding it challenging, I'm really happy to be here. At some stage, someone will come and say to me, do you know what? It's time to kind of go and do something new. Um, and either that will be on my instigation or someone else's instigation. But for the yeah. moment, um, while, you know, I'm still getting a kick out of it. And I work with some brilliant people, which is makes all the difference. You know, I absolutely love my co-presenter, Nikki Campbell. Um, we have a brilliant friendship and the team of young journalists who put us on air every day and support us are fantastic mm -hmm. as well. So, you know, the fact that you go in and can just have a laugh with your colleagues and, um, and, and sort of be with people you genuinely like spending time with, that makes a huge difference. Yes, totally. Well, it's really nice. It's quite uplifting to hear positive stories of liking work because when you're kind of always on the hunt for something different, it can be quite exhausting. And then when you find your home, your work home, it's quite, it's quite lovely. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I, early on in my career, I, you know, I had setbacks. And as I say to you, initially trying to get a break as a presenter, that was a bit tricky. And then I'd... Um, oh, I'd applied for a job at Radio 1 earlier on in my career because I felt like I should go out and get away from local radio. And um, and I had a terrible, had terrible interview. I was just, it was awful. I was completely ill-equipped for the job. And um, I decided at that point, I made a complete fool of myself. At that point, I wasn't going to go for a job unless I really, really 100% felt like it, it was absolutely me at my core, which that clearly wasn't. It was just an opportunity to go and do something else. So I learned from that. And then um, and then I'd also, like a couple of years before Five Live came to me, I'd gone to them saying, I, you know, I, I present and I think I'd have something that I could offer you and here's my demo tape and they'd sent me the standard rejection letter back. So it's about kind of just keeping on kind of picking away at, at it, isn't it? And mm -hmm. um, it's such a cliche to say, you know, if there's something you really want to do, just, just keep knocking at those doors. But it genuinely was true for yes, me. Yes, yes. Just never go away. Keep yeah, persisting. Just keep annoying people. <laughs> That's the key. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you so much for sharing your story and um, it was so, so great to meet you. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. It's been a delight to come and talk to you about it. Thank you.